I'm uh, excited to introduce Hannah Karate today. She's uh, going to present to us on a variety of somatic approaches to uh, stress, PTSD, and anxiety issues. Um, Hannah received her BA from University of Michigan in Language and Literature and her MA from Meridian College, Meridian University in 2005. She interned at Social Advocates for Youth, Family Service Agency, a special place therapeutic preschool, and private practice internships here in Santa Rosa. She's been a yoga and meditation teacher for over 25 years, lived in a meditation center after her studies at University of Michigan. She's trained in Iyengar? Yes. Yes, thank <laughs> you. Uh, Sivananda and Synergy Yoga and an acupressure massage, Jin Shin Jitsu, Reiki, and therapeutic touch. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> you got your own? All right, there you go. Thank you all for coming today. I'm delighted to see you, and I realize it's a big deal to carve out some time to get here, so I want to thank you so much. And uh, we're going to just jump right in. I might be moving a little fast so that you can actually have some experiential opportunities today as well as the PowerPoint presentations. Um, so just moving on here, it's very helpful to calm down our own nervous system, our own limbic system, so that when our clients sit with us, they receive that presence. And that is something, of course, unspoken, but that is something we can give as a gift to them if we can carve out some time for self-care. So we want to give that self-care, whether it's running, walking in a park, swimming, whatever you do to relax, I encourage you to do it even more. So this is a quote from Bessel van der Kolk, a wonderful trauma expert who has, uh, is the founder of the Trauma Center in Massachusetts. And many of you are very familiar with his work. Uh, he says there are three avenues for treating post-traumatic stress disorder. Top down by talk therapy, basically. And also, number two, by taking medicines that shut down inappropriate alarm systems, alarm reactions in the body. Or bottom up by allowing the body to have experiences that deeply and viscerally contradict the helplessness that results from trauma. Which one of these avenues is best for any particular survivor is an empirical question. Most people I've worked with require a combination. He goes on to say that all trauma is pre-verbal. Trauma by nature drives us to the edge of comprehension, cutting us off from language that is based on common experience. That is from his beautiful book that I highly recommend, The Body Keeps the Score. Fairly recent book, beautiful book. Um, so I'm going to be just mentioning 10 different somatic practices that can be used with clients. And we start in this presentation with meditation. Uh, I've mentioned John Kabat-Zinn as a wonderful meditation teacher He's an MD, and he has developed mindfulness-based stress reduction that is utilized at Kaiser, utilized all over the world, and uh, he's a wonderful teacher. Um, there's also, oh, so he teaches mindfulness meditation, and there's also compassion meditation, which he also teaches, as well as many other teachers of that compassion meditation. Anna, yes? That's going to help. This will help. Is this better? Yeah. Or turn it up a slight bit more? Okay, I have a quiet voice, so we'll turn it up. There we go, okay. So emotional freedom technique, some of you are familiar. This is the basic practice in energy psychology. If someone is highly stressed, you want to have them connect with their body because if they're highly stressed, they may actually be dissociating more or less. So you want to bring them back to their body. Um, integrative restoration is one of my primary practices. I've uh, studied with Richard Miller, psychologist. Um, for seven years, he was my mentor because he's a psychologist for 25, 30 years, and he's also a meditation teacher and a yoga teacher. So I've worked with him. I've helped him. Um, I provided music for some of his trainings and retreats, and uh, we've been colleagues for a long time. Um, Embodying Well-Being is a beautiful little book written by psychologist, clinical psychologist Julie Henderson. And she's based in Napa. 
This is the book, and you can get her products online, her books and various other things that she offers. She's actually the daughter of scientists, and uh, I think one of her parents was a scientist, the other was an artist, so she is very creative and she's very scientific. And she talks about uh, various practices that help us relax. Trauma-sensitive yoga, developed by David Emerson. Uh, David Emerson is a yoga teacher, and he came along just at the right time when Bessel van der Kolk was interested in finding out if yoga could help his PTSD clients. And so they formed an alliance, and um, David Emerson has written a beautiful book called Trauma-Sensitive Yoga in Therapy. And... Um, excellent, very simple, easy to read, and very practical. And he says that if you want to use trauma-sensitive yoga in your practice, get familiar with these practices. Do some stretches on your own. Do some breathing practices on your own. Go to a yoga class or, you know, take trainings in how to utilize yoga in therapy. But get comfortable in your own body, and then it'll be so much easier to use with your clients. So while we we work on ourselves so that it becomes easier to work with others. Uh, yoga Skills for Therapists and Yoga for Depression. These are books by yoga teacher Amy Weintraub. She had depression. She found that yoga really helped her with releasing that depression. And she's been doing trainings for 20 years in helping psychotherapists and yoga teachers learn to work with clients who are dealing with depression, anxiety, and trauma. She does trainings all over the United States, and her specific focus is what she calls life, life force yoga for anxiety and depression. So she offers various trainings for that. Um, somatic practices for anxiety, PTSD, and stress reduction. And these are practices that I have utilized uh, and developed over the last 20 years with my work with meditation students and yoga students and my own inner work. Very helpful practices. The next part is Unwinding the Belly by Allison Post. Um, so many people dealing with anxiety or trauma issues may have digestive issues, and this book addresses that. Walk and Talk Therapy, wonderful practice of going outdoors, outside the four walls of the therapy room and walking as you talk with your client. And Jin Shin Jitsu self-help practices, also called Japanese acupressure, are different ways to calm the body. You could perhaps have your fingertips under your collarbones and boost your immune system, or release a headache by placing your fingertips at the back of the head, just below the, the occipital ridge. So various practices that calm the nervous system and heal us, body and mind. Okay. Oh, it does go back, doesn't it? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, let's try this. Okay. Um, so we say, just couldn't stomach that situation. What a pain in the neck. Uh, some clients are dealing with various health issues. We have so many feelings, physically and emotionally. There is an interrelationship between the body and the mind. There is no way we can separate them. It's beneficial as therapists to have some um, connection in our work with our clients. How are they feeling physically and emotionally? All part of one piece. So this is a slide just about meditation. Beautiful book by John Kabat-Zinn, meditation teacher. It's called Wherever You Go, There You Are. And I've read this many times to my meditation groups over the years. It's a beautiful book you want to keep on your shelf and just read one sentence. It can change your day. Um, I do offer weekly meditation groups here in Santa Rosa, and there are flyers. Um, actually, flyers are in your handout, so you'll see at the very last page there's information about that. Um, I have a Tuesday group at 3 p.m. That's at my home office, so only high-functioning clients invited. And then I have a Wednesday group at my more public office in West Santa Rosa, and that's 11.15 on Wednesdays. Um, so, oh, there, has, there have been many, many 
research studies about how meditation can help people at the neural level, at the level of body-mind healing. Mindfulness and loving-kindness have been studied and researched for many years. We're going to go over briefly information about emotional freedom technique. And there's a certain pattern of um, acupressure meridians. So we have meridians and you want to touch certain areas that help us connect with the body, which connects us to the present moment. If we're in our mind, thinking about the past, thinking about the future, it's hard to get in our body sometimes. It's hard to get back in the present. So a lot of this work in somatic psychotherapy is about coming back to the present. Um, this is a quote from Bessel van der Kolk. He says, in our early therapy sessions, this was a, a client with severe PTSD. She was not able to talk with him about her issues. It was non, she was not able to deal at the verbal level. So he said, we used every technique I've learned over the years, like breathing with a focus on the out breath, which activates the relaxing parasympathetic nervous system. I also taught her to use her fingers to tap the sequence of acupressure points on various parts of her body. This practice often taught under the name of emotional freedom technique, which has been shown to help patients stay within the window of tolerance and often has positive effects on PTSD. This is a core practice from energy psychology, and there are some wonderful videos on YouTube if you have a client dealing with depression and they are open to the possibility of practicing during the week every day they could go online look up YouTube emotional freedom technique and they will have some very good videos and it's a call and response activity so in other words they might li they might watch the video and the video is saying you know, if that client is dealing with depression, they would say, even though I sometimes feel so depressed, I totally love and completely accept myself. And then the client would say it back. So it's a call and response with the YouTube video or with you when you have the client in your office. And we have people who are offering trainings here in Santa Rosa on emotional freedom technique. So um, that's easily, you can look up Santa Rosa uh, emotional freedom technique trainings and that's available here in Santa Rosa. Beautiful book by another psychotherapist. Um, this is called Five Simple Steps to Emotional Healing, the last self-help book you will ever need. And this is by Gloria Aronson. So I had so much fun preparing for this presentation because I have been immersed in these practices for more than 25 years, but that was all nonverbal. And I was like, okay, how do we put this into words? And then I've given myself the treat of reading a lot of books by other people who are doing similar work. So it helped me find the words. It's been really an enriching experience. So thank you for being here to join me in this practice of going over our somatic practices. And finally, there are many books by Gary Craig, who actually um, came from a background of science. He's not a psychotherapist, but he has found that this work has done um, such a good job with his own life and with countless thousands of people he has trained and worked with. A lot of excellent um, results. Again, from Bessel van der Kolk, The Body Keeps the Score, we're talking about sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So in other words, we're talking about moving from fight or flight response into rest and digest. He said, in PTSD, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems are out of sync and the heart rate variability is low. Our interest in yoga gradually evolved from a focus on learning whether yoga can change heart rate variability, which it can, to helping traumatized people learn to comfortably inhabit their tortured bodies. And he's not exaggerating. When you work with people who have severe PTSD. I, sometimes I have clients who cannot come for psychotherapy because their back hurts too much. They have to wait for the doctor appointment to heal their back. So it's like, how can you work with, with the client if they can't attend their session? There's so much 
pain from PTSD, and we want to find ways, simple ways, that they can access, like tapping, like gentle, easy yoga. And we're talking easy, I mean easy, like you're sitting in a chair, and if you want to do trauma-sensitive yoga, instead of sitting up tall, which we could say, you're invited to sit up tall if that feels right for you. There's no, it's all invitational. There is no demand. There is no authority figure in the room. There's just like, see if you'd like to perhaps lean back and see if you might engage the core muscles if you lean back in your chair. Or how does that feel for you? Or if you don't want to do it, that's fine. So it's very open, it's very gentle. We're not talking about big yoga poses. Maybe see if you would like to lean your head to one side. How does that feel for you? So it's very easy. Um, anytime, this is from David Emerson in this beautiful book about trauma sensitive yoga. Anytime we breathe or move in a new way as part of trauma treatment, we begin to challenge in a gentle but clear way the notion that my body is not capable of having new experiences and all it can do is hunker down and resist traumatic memories that are hidden inside every seemingly innocuous muscle movement. Trauma-sensitive yoga is invitational. It is a shared, authentic experience. So he even quotes John Bowlby and attachment theory in his book on trauma-sensitive yoga. Um, He says, when you have a shared authentic experience where both the therapist and the client are exploring their inner experience, they are together. It's not like the client is all alone in their experience. They're both exploring to see how it feels to lean their head to one side. For many participants, a growing awareness of ownership and control over their body led to appreciation for one's body including a deeper sense of responsibility for self-care and the tendency to listen to my body a lot more now. This is the full title of his book, Trauma-Sensitive Yoga and Therapy, Bringing the Body into Treatment. And um, I've seen this so many times. People will come to a couple of my gentle yoga classes, people who I know have some issues going on or traumas or anxieties, and, and they'll turn to me you know, privately and say, I haven't eaten chocolate in three days. You know, this is, I've come to two of your classes in the last few days and it's really changing my normal patterns. And thank you, you know, people are able to feel what their body needs and wants because we're, we're beginning to reconnect with that. So it feels like, oh no, my body doesn't really want that right now. They get the feeling inside. He uses the word interoception. Before I leave that trauma-sensitive yoga topic, he uses the word interoception again and again in the book, which is more like exploring your inner landscape, basically, is what it is. Yes? Hannah, is he talking, too, about not necessarily holding, as a therapist, holding a yoga class where one would be dressed for yoga, have... Mm -hmm. Is he talking about not necessarily a yoga class, per se, but a therapy session where he might integrate some of these directions or moves, so... Good question. He does both. At the trauma center, they offer classes for people who have PTSD, and they just come in and they do the class for one hour or however long it is, like probably one hour, and then they go back and they may talk with their therapist about it, or they may, you know, talk privately with this teacher at the end, Um, Also, it's often done at the trauma center and elsewhere, one-on-one in psychotherapy. uh, He mentioned it as, um, and Bessel van der Kolk mentioned as a few minutes, perhaps like, oh, this client, with this client, we have a practice of starting our first 10 minutes of our session with trauma-sensitive yoga. And that could be a simply, you know, very simple, like we're going to breathe, is it okay if we do a little bit of breathing practice? Would that be comfortable for you right now? And is it okay if we start our session with that? So, you know, they make it a a little ritual or a little kind of a organized part of their therapy practice. Thank you. Feel free if questions come up. It's nice to uh, interact with you in that way.
Oh, what's your, um, I didn't mean to list it as a disorder. I, I listed abundance EFT tapping videos on YouTube. In other words, there are YouTube videos for just about everything. And uh, yes, there are YouTube videos for depression and for anxiety. But on another topic, there are YouTube videos for just about anything you would like. So I'm sorry, it was probably well, out of line to include abundance. Okay. Sorry. Abundance of, abundance of videos about all kinds of things. <laughs> A little bit off topic, but thank you for bringing us back to the focus, somatic practices. And no, that was really relevant. Thank you. Um, I think we've already mentioned this, that Amy Weintraub uh, has written these two books. They've been very popular. And um, they're right. This one is called Yoga Skills for Therapists. It's her more recent book. And she includes a lot of research and a lot of case studies. Um, includes a lot of information about various types of breathing practices. And this one was her first book, Yoga for Depression. Um, again, a lot of case studies, a lot of worldwide research that she's included information about where the research has been done on yoga for mental health, and yoga for depression. Okay. She's based in Arizona, but she does a lot of trainings um, all over the United States. This beautiful little book is called Embodying Well-Being, and I discovered it about 20 years ago. I was just in the healing process myself at that point, had, um, a lot of things going on, and I just thought, this is great. It, it's so um, healing to bring this into yoga classes that I've offered over the years where people learn to sigh or yawn or shake off their anxiety in various simple ways. So this is um, one of the um, practitioners of this embodying well-being practice says, it is central to the practice of embodying well-being to directly support well-being by learning the skills needed. Human beings are born with built-in regulators that tend to arise spontaneously to move us back toward well-being. We use those as our basic practices. So this might include yawning, jiggling, laughing, sighing, rocking, squatting, humming, patting. She's talking about patty cake. She says you can't be in an angry, blaming, furious mood if you're literally doing patty cake. <laughs> I mean, having the client buy into that would be the hardest part, but <laughs> once they get there, it's, it's home free. So, <laughs> what's that? Couples. <laughs> We're going to do start with, I always start my couples counseling with, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they would not put up with it. But anyway, <laughs> wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> <laughs> with each other. Okay, no. try that next time. Um, but she has one called stretching, and these are in the words of Julie Henderson, clinical psychologist, um, uh, daughter of those wonderful scientists. She's, she does bring a lot of science, but she's very playful. She says, all through the body, holding things together and holding things up is connective tissue, tissue that connects. You might think of it as the body's built-in cling wrap, this tissue has tremendous strength and resilience. It also has bioelectric properties. That is, when, when it is tugged gently, it generates tiny electrical impulses which are experienced by the body as comforting and healing and regenerative. When you stretch, you are gently tugging these tissues all over the body. Every, tissue has a, every kind of tissue has a favorite kind of movement and a favorite way of being stretched. Conten connective tissue loves to stretch, to stretch and be stretched. If you stretch just enough, your connective tissues will respond by producing the neurochemicals of relaxation and comfort. This is a gift you can give yourself whenever you choose. And so that is kind of a basis of bringing in a little bit of movement into our work with clients it is something that can be easily felt. Um, I'll give you one more from Julie Henderson. This is humming. 
And actually, with psychotherapy clients, I have not done any of my music therapy. I was a music teacher for many years before becoming a psychotherapist, but I don't bring that into the therapy room. And I don't do hands-on somatic psychotherapy either. It's all about teaching people practices they can use at home every day. And each person will have a favorite thing they like to do. Maybe somebody likes to stretch their neck and someone else likes to learn Japanese acupressure to relax. Okay, so that's embodying well-being. Okay, I'll quickly show you jiggling. Jiggling. And you get to make a sound. <sighs> that's jiggling. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I have, over the years, I've incorporated those teachings from Julie Henderson and Richard Miller, psychologist, and many of these others I've studied into the work that I do with clients. I've taught more yoga classes than I can count. I, I either do or teach one or two hours a day of yoga. And as Amy Weintraub would say, um, by the way, I'm not dealing with depression, but I do have a genetic predisposition to anxiety. So Amy Weintraub says um, that people take meds for depression or anxiety every day. And in the same way, if you want a real benefit from a yoga or meditation practice, it's a daily practice. It's not just, oh yeah, go to, med go to this once a week. It's really to... Sometimes I feel like it's the total tranquilizer. You do that one hour or two hours, whether it's with clients or on your own, it's very beneficial. Oh, I do want to say, if we go back for a moment, there are also other practices such as Tai Chi and Qigong that help clients come back to the present moment, to their breath and their embodied self. And um, I have a dear friend, Kitty Costello, who's a psychotherapist in San Francisco, and she's also a Qigong teacher. And she has a practice of including a little bit of Qigong into her sessions, which is also, you can have a Qigong warm-up like this. You can bring people back into their body by moving. There are many Qigong warm-ups that bring people back to the present and to their breath. There's another beautiful book called Authentic Movement. And this goes way back to grad school, but uh, we studied authentic movement with Suzanne Lovell. Yeah, authentic movement written by Mary Starks Whitehouse, Janet Adler, and Joan Chodoral. And they talk about Jung in this book, that Jung worked with some student and some clients who actually would dance or move during their therapy sessions. So there is a lot of history and a lot of precedence in bringing the body into treatment. They also talk about uroboric movement, which is self-soothing movement, anything like rocking. I do a lot of my um, somatic psychotherapy work. Uh, if someone comes to me for a private yoga therapy session, we have a yoga mat and a blanket and they come down to the floor because it's peaceful and relaxing to connect with the energy of the earth. As, as new age as that might sound, it's very effective physiologically. Speaking of lying down on the couch or the floor, this is What's the Couch Got to Do With It? It's an article by Jennifer Kuntz, psychologist. The lowdown on lying down on the couch in psychoanalysis. <laughs> I realize we're not doing psychoanalysis, but I have found it tremendously helpful to invite people. Uh, when, when we do the IREST protocol, hopefully we'll have time to do some of that today. Um, but it's very helpful for people to lie down and come back to themselves as they close their eyes, whether they're sitting or lying down, either on a couch or a yoga mat, they come back to what's going on inside of them, to their feelings, their memories, to what they really want to talk to you about. So um, I started working with Richard Miller, who's the psychologist who teaches this uh, very codified protocol for working with clients. And um, I'm going to lead you through some of that today so you can really see 
this is how it's done and this is why Hannah invites them to lie down and come back to themselves. We go through the body, the mind, the breath, the emotions and we really want to check in with all of those. So she says, when we recline, we drift into that more dreamlike state in which we recall forgotten feelings and memories, where we gain access to deeper sensations, fantasies, anxieties, and longings. Freud acknowledged that this recumbent position is reminiscent of the hypnotic method from which psychoanalysis first evolved. The use of the couch is believed to be useful for both the patient and analyst. We want to get beneath the surface and beyond the ordinary concerns of the day. To talk more about, we want to talk about more than what we would say at the dinner table. Otherwise, how can we get to the bottom of things? She says, what is most important is to create a safe space in which the patient feels free to tell the analyst more and more. If that atmosphere can be created in a face-to-face -face arrangement, then I say, so be it. But if the patient and analyst can bear the added vulnerability of using the couch, an unusual and precious freedom of expression may be found. And one other thing I want to mention about the work that I do with uh, clients who are open to a yoga therapy session, and sometimes I may work with a client in talk therapy and we might just have 10 minutes of on-the-mat yoga in, in my office my more public office. So um, it includes that rocking. It includes self-soothing, whether it's massaging your jaw to see if it's stuck in tension, relaxing your shoulders. So it includes all of that. And I think of it as very um, similar to bilateral stimulation to what is done in EMDR. I don't, since you're sitting down, I'm not going to lie down on the floor to show you, but there are, there are movements where you connect with your, your perhaps turning your head and rocking your foot, and you're lying on the floor, and so your foot is going like this, and your head is going like that. To me, this is bilateral stimulation. You are doing this cross-brain integration. Or if I'm doing a standing session, it's like, we're getting the energy moving. And um, cross-brain integration, this is from Brain Gym. I don't know if any of you have heard of Brain Gym, but basically you want to integrate the left and right side of the brain, the rational and the emotional creative. Integrating both of them clears trauma. So if we have trauma memories from long ago or just stress from yesterday or whatever, you can clear that. And one of the, the practices that we do on the floor is that rocking the foot and slowly turning the head. It's just clearing. It clears everything. Then you're free for your next client. Energy's clear. They can receive that clear energy. Um, they don't go at the same time. The foot goes like a windshield wiper. Left, right, left, right, left, right. The head is going slower. can't do it standing up. <laughs> you do one foot at a time. Yes. Yes, there are definitely many things that I can do with clients sitting. And um, I would say, you know, if, some, if you're sitting, you can still do this one. You can sit in your chair. And you can still do this one. This is what's called cross-crawl in brain gym. You're integrating the left and right side of your brain. So if you're taking a walk and you want to get the full benefit of that walk, leave your purse at home. Let your arms swing. Do 20 minutes of this even standing in place and your left and right side of your brain are going to be integrated. You're going to feel so much better and clear. Even, you know, you're at the computer for hours and it's like, okay, no, I'm doing it. Uh, you can even do it this way. You don't have to raise your arms. Just opposites. Very simple. So I learned a lot of these opposites and what I think of as bilateral stimulation from a yoga teacher, um, Charmaine Lee, who had been a ballet teacher. Any questions? Yeah. What, what are the implications for someone that <clears throat> may have a paralysis in one of the limbs, for instance? 
Well, we would want to learn more about their medical history. I mean, there may have been an accident. I don't know. But if it was congenital, I mean, I really... In other words, how would you do these sorts of things with someone that say had one limb Oh, you simply or? work with what is present in that moment. I had someone come in and he wanted a private movement session with me, a private yoga session with me. He couldn't walk. But we talked about it, and he couldn't lie down, and he couldn't sit down. We did what he could do. And it turned out, later on, I found out years ago, he had a great Tai Chi practice. And so we stood there, and we were doing... And he came to me two or three times, and then he said, Oh, I don't need to come. I'm doing my daily yoga. I'm doing my daily Tai Chi. Because he had been like a Tai Chi master. And he had not been using it for a long time, and he just got back to it. And then he was able to be in his body, and his back got better, and he healed himself. It wasn't, he, it wasn't some magic yoga Hannah did. It was just like, what's going on with this person? How can they move from where they are? He was able to do this. Yeah. Yes, exactly. The envisioning. Wow. Envisioning. And Richard Miller in the Integrative Restoration would take that situation and he would say, what would you like for your health and well-being if that left leg is unable to move? What would you like for your left leg? And, and, and as you envision it, could you please say it in the present tense as if it's happening right now, that what you would what that person would like for their leg would be happening in this moment. And if that were happening, how would you feel physically? And as you bring that in, now we get into law of attraction, but as you bring in that envisioning what you want and how it would feel and say it in the present tense, that is the law of attraction. You're bringing it. You're allowing it to be a little easier to move in that direction. That's, that's a whole other topic, but it is relevant, you know, you want to work with people where they are and give them some hope. There's never a time when there's no hope, even if the doctors say there's no hope. That may or may not be the case. There's always hope. There's room for hope. One, one other thing about that is if, unless that person has no sensitivity in his body at all, the, the, the clinician can be tapping on the person back and forth. So yes. That. Yes. Yes, that is good. Yes, even if that's good. And there are tapping devices and or just hands. Yeah, good. Yes, just, you're welcome. In order, to, uh, in order to fall asleep, you lay down and you're do, you're, uh, you have to let go of your defense structure to relax. So it makes, and it kind of replicates infancy. I mean, so there seems like a makes sense that there's a different state of mind when you lie down, if you feel safe enough to yes. do that. Yes. And and so you could become aware of much more when you drop your defense structure because you're shutting the world out. You don't need to defend against anything. Right. Or perform for anyone. Right. It's just so like it opens you... up something new. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it's beautiful that you mentioned that because I think that's what. Uh, drew me to it. I had been working for, with yoga students for 25 years and I see at the end mm -hmm. of class there's 20 minutes of relaxation or 10 minutes and they're like, and they come up and they're out of that 10 minutes, they're radiant, they're peaceful, they're looking good. And I'm like, wow. wow. They just lay down for 10 minutes, that's all. And all I said was relax your arms and legs. Mm -hmm. There's yes. nothing to it, really. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Reflects a lot of the work I've done for a lot of years, and my question is: Do you have any experience working with severely disturbed, uh, even really people with real limited resources, maybe even homeless people, with any of this? Sorry. Personality disorder. Well, personality disorder, yeah, but I'm thinking more maybe uh, paranoid, schizophrenic people, people who are struggling with daily life, homeless, whatever. I, I'm, I haven't been working with that population specifically, but M Richard Miller ha um, does have projects that are integrative restoration for the homeless and uh, for various populations. And if we have time, I might do a little bit of Richard's uh, PowerPoint presentation, which he emailed me recently. So 
um, that will give a list of certain programs that he has been offering across the country. Yeah, thank you. Yes. about um, Judith Day and, and Judith um, I'm Katie um, what you just uh, asked the question of um, a couple of years ago I worked in an agency in Richmond where I worked with clients who were mostly homeless um, mostly schizophrenia diagnosis a lot of paranoia a lot of um, uh, voices auditory hallucinations and we ran a group that was kind of similar to what Hannah does um, a little different it was it was mainly mindfulness and um, uh, walking meditation, things like that, and it was very, very effective. It was actually one of the most popular groups that we had with that population, that for some reason, um, there was something about the being in the moment that was really helpful, and anything that brought them into their body that was very helpful. Um, and I did some research about whether or not it was, you know, good practice to use mindfulness with people that were, um, you know, having psychosis, and it turns out that, in general, the consensus now is yes, that it is a good idea, but not to do things like guided imagery, um, because that can be a little too confusing, you know, be going out of reality, but anything that's focusing on the moment and bringing them back to the moment can be really helpful. So pretty much everything that Hannah is talking about. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Katie. Um, yeah, <coughs> yeah, I was curious about... Um, when you're working with a client whose uh, nervous system is really activated, mm -hmm. fight, flight, freeze, and there are deeper issues, um, their defenses are keeping them from settling for a reason because right. there's overwhelm in the system, there's too much um, trauma, there's too much pain to face. Right. Um, there might be personality disorder issues. Um, what do you, how do you help people um, regulate when parts of them are fighting so hard to have them not regulate to help them? It is a quandary. I sometimes, uh, currently working with someone who uh, was a veteran uh, and has severe PTSD, and I have all these wonderful practices, and they're not able to engage in the practices, and it's just hard. You know, you offer, we offer what we can offer, and people, when they're ready or able, to partake of those offerings can do that. And sometimes all you can offer is the compassion. They may come and they may say oh, how upset they are and how hard it is, and, and all I can do is simply sit there and be with them and offer them compassion. If they cannot open to any of the practices, all I can do is simply be there to listen to them. Thank you, that, that's validating. I, I have found that the IFS work is really helpful. I have found that IFS work is really helpful in this situation to help um, develop mindfulness, uh, awareness to watch the parts. Um, what is I? Oh, internal, internal family, family system. Yes. But I, I just yeah. appreciate you saying it's it's difficult. It's challenging. Right. Thank right. you. Right. Sometimes the client might just want to be heard. I don't know. Or, but yeah. I mean, if they're able to, certainly we try to offer some tools for them and see if that can work. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. What I found is most challenging clients at some point in the therapy will get the the breathing, if anything, lengthen. I don't know if you're going to go yes. into lengthening the exhale, yes. Yes. taking their baseline breath, and Great. really um, going in a long inhale for exhale six right. and most people can get that yes. and feel a moment there of oh have the body wrap around the breath exactly and so that same client went to a trauma center in southern california for 10 days and came back and that one practice she came back and she said i want to show you what i learned you know and she was so excited and she inhale like this and you exhale longer and she was just radiant. And, you know, this person is usually like this, and she was just peaceful and radiant. And I was like, that's great. You're really doing well. <laughs> yes. I totally support that in four out of six. I work with teens. And um, I work in, uh, I volunteer in the schools, and I often only have 20 minutes with them. Yes. So one of the things that teens are really into, of course, are their smartphones or their mom's smartphone. Yes. And many of you already know there's something called the heart rate monitor. Yes. Free app. Great. And to s do the psycho ed, I just show them that first. Great. And then we talk about 
what it means to be at a hundred or higher. Yeah. And then we practice, see how low you can go. Oh, with in for four great. and out for six, and it yeah. takes just about 15 minutes. That is so great. Excellent. Excellent.